On August 29th of 2014, patrons of the Midway Drive-In in Mineto, New York, began arriving in typical fashion, nearly three hours before the first presentation. Many were there for the opportunity to squeeze in one last summer activity before the school year began a few days later. The slowly gathering bustle of normal drive-in activities, playing on the lawn, going to get dinner at the concession stand, or playing board games under a tent, all had a familiar ring to them, as they've had for decades. But what made this evening's gathering different from all that had gone before was that for most patrons, what was happening was nearly unimaginable only a month before. For in a summer filled with extreme tumultuous weather, an early July storm destroyed the Midway's 66-year-old wooden screen, leaving many fans wondering if this was the end of an era. The reason to be there that night was obvious, to celebrate the rebirth of a cherished recreational and cultural venue. I sort of believe in the concept of physical spaces taking on the events and the emotions and experiences that have happened there. And 66 years is a lot of experience to, for one place to take in. Nineteen forty-eight was the year the Midway Drive-In officially came to be. It was built at a time when drive-ins were sprouting up all across the United States, fueled primarily by a suddenly burgeoning car culture. The Midway was christened as such because, geographically, it was located in the town of Mineto, midway between Fulton and Oswego. The Midway's current owner, John Nagelschmidt Sr., began working there in 1961 as a concession worker for the drive-in's original owners, Irving and Reuben Cantor. Within a few short years, he was offered the opportunity to manage the place. It was about this time that he also began his career as a high school science teacher in nearby Fulton, got married, and began to raise a family. But by the early 1980s, drive-ins began to decline in popularity with American moviegoers. The Midway's second owners, wanting to change course, offered to sell it to the man who had managed it for nearly 20 years. So in 1987, Nagelschmidt and his wife Judy took a chance and purchased it. The, the reason for, for buying it uh, is it was just an offer I couldn't refuse when uh, Kalinske and Gerard were ready to get rid of the place. They, they made me an offer and uh, they, they made it very easy for me to finance it. And uh, I think they gave it to me at a bargain price. Though not a lucrative venture for the Nagelschmitz, the family-run operation managed to stay salient through constant change within the fickle drive-in theater business. Through creativity and sheer determination, coupled with a steady paycheck from teaching, he managed to keep the midway afloat. The revolutionary switch to digital projection in 2013 proved to be his biggest financial challenge to that point, an obstacle that caused many theater owners to call it quits. If I have one regret about buying the drive-in and teaching is I never did have my summers off, so I think I missed a lot with my kids growing up because I was there every night, but they tell me I made up for it because they were at the drive-in during the summer, you know, and they enjoyed it. My friends loved going to the drive-in with us. That was really cool. We would all climb in the back of the station wagon with our pillows and everything and just snuggle up and, and watch the movies. My parents are my heroes for sustaining that business through the hard times. People see it on a busy night and think we're bringing in a lot of money, but there's a lot of overhead, obviously, and there's usually five very slow nights for one or two busy nights. Undoubtedly, what has sustained the Midway through the difficult times and ultimately led to more prosperous years can be summed up in one word, family. In addition to his immediate family, over the years, Nagelschmidt has had relatives, friends, and students work for him. It was entirely a family business for us, essentially four or five families that have worked with us to 
keep the theater going and that probably lends a little bit to um, the feeling of family at the drive-in. One of the things that's great about our community is there's a lot of people in our community that don't go on big vacations in the summer and every Friday night that's their that's where they go. They spend that's where they spend their money. They come and that's their little mini vacation and those are our regulars and they are the, they are the heart and soul of our business, the ones that come back week after week after week and you you worry about them when they don't show up because you're so used to seeing them and they'll stop by and you get to know them and they're a part of the family too. It was precisely with family in mind that former Fulton resident Rob Weske took his wife and kids to see the Midway Drive-In Theater on July 8th, 2014. Determined to show them some of his favorite childhood hangouts, Rob drove through a torrential downpour on Route 48. The heavy rain made it impossible to stop. So instead, he snapped a picture on his cell phone, remarking as he did, Hey, that's the drive-in we used to go to when I was a kid. It would be the last image ever taken of the standing, structurally intact, wooden screen. I admit, when I first looked at it, I thought we were done. I didn't see any way to uh, rebuild it, but uh, the community, uh, they, you know, it was, it was like a wake there for several days. I didn't know that. Weather patterns that summer had been especially volatile. A tree line flanking the southwest edge of the property, a concrete block wall a short distance from the ticket booth, and the massive wooden screen itself were the most noteworthy casualties. I'd been working around the drive-in that day and uh, I decided to get down and see my friend Carl at the Bob and Pop's diner and uh, just as we were finishing up supper I look out the window and uh, it was obviously a storm coming. It was a different kind of storm. The wind kicked up and suddenly it started raining and the rain turned white like I'd never seen before and kind of obscured the view out the window and canopies and stuff were flying across the road and pretty serious downpour for only 15-20 minutes. And, Within minutes of the screen's implosion, Lauren Pepper of Oswego took this shot and posted it to her Facebook page. The stunning image went viral and was quickly picked up by local newscasts. So here's the radar reflectivity of the storm that caused the damage in Minetto. Um, you see the radar reflectivity, it's bowing here, right, pretty much pointing right into Minetto, the heart of Oswego County. That indicates really strong winds hitting the surface and bowing outward. And that's exactly what caused the damage. It was a bow echo, a line of downbursts, really strong winds that came out of the thunderstorm, hit the ground, and spread out radially. It was not a tornado. Steiger's assertion that damage to the midway was not caused by a tornado is plausible, in that the concession stand, which sits roughly halfway between the tree line and the screen, was not hit. It was like this line of storms it was like dropping bombs, little bombs on certain parts of the community. And we call those local areas of strong downdrafts, downbursts. And they can be a mile wide, less than a mile wide. Um, they even they, they, these things called microbursts, right, which can even be really small, like only a few hundred feet wide. They can cause pretty good damage, but just in a very local area, like a couple blocks. Once the storm cleared, Nagel Schmidt immediately left the diner amid concerns of flooding on the lot. For those anxious first arrivals on the lot, it was an unimaginable scene. 
with flooding the furthest thing from their minds. Due to numerous road closures caused by excessive fallen debris along his route home, the drive-in's owner, ironically, knew nothing of the destruction that had much of central New York in shock. Coming up 481, I noticed big trees down by the monument place and a lot of brush in the road, but I did get through there and then uh, eventually I got across the bridge in Minetto and the firemen had the road blocked there and they told me that I couldn't go through and I says, well, I got to get up the drive and see what's going on. And I, no, he asked me where it was going and I said the drive and he says, yeah, you better get up there. So when I came around the bend, there were a lot of cars in the driveway, and this took me about an hour and a half to get from Oswego up to the drive-in, and, and uh, I didn't quite know what was going on with all the cars, and I looked up and I saw what was left of the screen, a big hole blown through it, and most of it on the ground, and what startled me even more was uh, the cement wall was blown over, and first reaction, the place is destroyed, you know, and uh, then I got you know, realizing that what could have happened, it could have been worse if customers had been there and kids playing around the screen or the wall falling on a car. So that was a blessing. And when I got the phone call after the windstorm, I knew it was a bad windstorm. It was, it was crazy. It was crazy wind like I had never seen before. And my daughter and I were upstairs watching the wind and she's like, Mama, this is crazy wind. I'm like, I've never seen anything like this before. And she said, what if, what if the screen goes down? And I said, that screen's never going to go down. It's been there 66 years. I've watched it. It's gone through everything. It's going to be fine. And after the wind stopped, we went outside and walked around and picked up around my house. And my phone rang and it was my girlfriend that works at the drive-in. And she told me that there had been significant damage at the Midway drive-in. And I immediately hung up the phone and told my kids to get their stuff together, told my son to grab my camera. And we started driving down and my daughter was in the back seat. She was like ready to cry. And I looked, I said, this is not your fault. You didn't cause the screen to go down. And, um, but I knew it was the screen. I knew it was, and I was just in a panic. And when I pulled in and saw it, it was, crazy. I felt like a, my heart had been ripped out. I felt like a part of my life was gone. My nephew had told me to get down there right away and I pictured maybe one panel off the screen. To see that staggering image of after knowing that structure and having it be the most significant structure I, I would say in my life and I walked parked my car by the marquee and walked in and tried to soak in what was happening in the moment. And dad was sitting on the fence right in front of the projection booth. And I just walked up to him and hugged him and started crying. And um, then we took a little while to try to accommodate the emotions, and then we got to work figuring out how we were going to uh, resurrect the screen. And it was a strange feeling. There were all these people around, and uh, it, it was like going to a wake or somebody had just died, and uh, everybody, you know, they're asking. I, 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 don't, I think they were kind of afraid to talk to me because they didn't know uh, and I didn't really know where my, where my head was on it. But the my... next day, I remember everyone was just crushed. I personally wanted to just stay home and lay in bed all day. Um, and then later on in the day, probably around 5 o'clock, they started talking about getting a cleanup crew in and working on plans to find a new screen or just stop doing it all together and turn everything down. I think the third day after, that's when everybody started to go back to doing the normal things. We tried to take it off our minds so it didn't get us down too much. I don't think there was ever a question in my head of will we reopen, it was when we will reopen. And to know that my dad was so um, just, I don't know, he's, I don't want to say he, maybe forlorn was a good word, but um, I was concerned that he might not rebuild and that worried me a lot. So. I, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, and then talking with both of my kids, and they both said that, Dad, we got to keep it going. But I didn't know uh, how we were going to do that, where the money was going to come from. I hope that he got to see this summer in the wake 
uh, of everything, how much people not just love the Midway, but I, th I think it's about him too. If we go back a second to that phone call I got on the way up here, it was from uh, little Maddie Reinhardt and her mom. They were off at a Girl Scout camp somewhere, and I don't know how they heard about it, but they heard about it somewhere down near Binghamton before I heard about it in Oswego. And uh, all, all the message was is, John, we're going to help. And I didn't really know what that was all about. Well, when it first happened, um, we were watching the news, and um, I was at my co-leader's house and her kids were there and one of her daughters Shelby one of my Girl Scouts came flying down the stairs Miss Cindy Miss Cindy Miss Cindy the drive-in and they were devastated. I was at Girl Scout camp and someone um, told me that it's ruined it's gone and so I asked my mom if it's true and she said it is and I just started like bawling and I froze and I didn't want to be bothered and you know. So when you were driving home, she's like, we got to do something, Mom. I said, Shelby said the same thing. So she's sitting back there and she's thinking, and then she says, why don't we sell t-shirts? I said, okay, you guys can design a t-shirt. And then eventually they came around and we talked, and uh, Cindy, my, Maddie's mom, said, well, Maddie wants to help raise money. She thinks if we got a, made a, uh, had a t-shirt made and we sold t-shirts, we can make some money. And, I thought it was a polite offer. I didn't really take it all that serious. I, you know, if we can make a couple bucks doing that, but I, d I didn't think it would be significant. I said, well, this all will depend on John. You know, John's pretty devastated. He, he we got to give him time. And she's like, all right. I said, do you want to go see John now? No, nope. she didn't want to come. And that was on a Thursday. Sunday, I took her back to camp and she was there for a week. When I picked her up on Friday, I'm ready to go see the drive-in. I want to go see John. We came, and at that point, he had started cleaning a little bit. She was completely devastated, and she says to John, we need to fundraise. He still wasn't ready yet, but at least he was willing to talk about it. My first thought when people were asking me, what are you going to do? I said, i got to talk to the insurance company and see uh, what, the, what the outcome is. And when the adjuster came out, uh, he told me what my coverage was, and. Uh, he said, it's up to you what you, what you do with them. But uh, obviously the first thing, it's dangerous, you gotta get it cleaned up. In the aftermath of the storm, it would be an anxious first few days for the Nagelschmitz. Contact with a local pole barn construction firm to rebuild a similar wooden structure was favorable at first, and within striking distance of John's insurance coverage. But then came some bad news. He called me two days later and said the engineers looked at it and said there's no way in hell we're touching that. That's just too big a structure to be made out of wood. Complete demolition of the screen and cleanup of the site would take two weeks. This interim gave Girl Scout Troop 101 time to prepare for the crucial first fundraiser and John time to find an alternative to a new wooden structure. So we brought over a few of the girls over and talked to John about fundraising and he was willing to keep talking and you know how are we going to do this and I said we have to do it fast because we are approaching Harbor Fest and I said Harbor Fest is going to be our key weekend we, we really need to um, get people while they're here in Oswego. That first weekend that we started selling t-shirts at Harbor Fest and I remember setting up and Keith and Chris Jones helping us to get everything set up and just being so upbeat about it and the Girl Scouts and the Girl Scout parents coming down and setting up the things and just watching people just come by and show their support and tell a story and throw a dollar in the box just gave you hope that their people are good, people are amazing. It really got to me. I was in tears a couple times when they had the t-shirt sale going on and these people would come in and they'd, they'd tell me how they don't even come to drive-in, but uh, the drive-in has to be here, you know, we met here, you know, uh, and uh, they wanted it for posterity, and I said, I think we ought to have one of the drive-ins. So we had two sites, one at the drive-in and one at Harbor Fest. And that first weekend, between the two sites, I think we took in including donations, very close to $35,000, and I was just overwhelmed. 
It wasn't all profit, of course, because we had to pay for the shirts. Sunday was quite an eye-opener for him, and he was so humbled, I think, based on what was donated and how many people came out to help and who came and talked to him. He says he doesn't usually get emotional, but he got emotional that day when we were counting the money. Bolstered by a sudden new optimism, John Nagelschmidt forged ahead with plans to rebuild using steel. He knew of only one firm in the country who made these, Selby Products of Richfield, Ohio. This contact proved crucial, and his fortunes were about to get better. He said, John, uh, we're building a three-screen drive-in in Texas, and one of the screens is about the size of your screen was, and we don't have to have that in Texas till October, so if you can guarantee the money, we can modify it for your site, and we can probably have it up by Labor Day. Success on the fundraising front continued to gain momentum, both locally and regionally. Setting up shop at Buffalo Wild Wings and the Syracuse Regional Market, along with positive media coverage, created more broad-based support for the Midway. But perhaps the one event that topped them all in terms of putting the fun in fundraising was the cruise in, held on the Midway grounds one month after the storm. That day, the car show alone, I, I think, brought in some of our five, six thousand dollars. So, by the time we were all done, we were within ten thousand dollars of what the total cost of the project was. He didn't want to ask for help. That's what he always kept saying. I don't want to ask people to help. You know, I, I really believe the reason he did it was because the girls wanted to do it so badly. He refers to them as his girls. And then they're like, you were a big part of the rebuild, weren't you? I'm like, yeah, I was out there like every day selling. And they're like, why did you do it? It was your summer. It's your break to rest and have fun. I'm like, it was fun. And to know that Maddie allowed him to open his heart and soul, basically, to everyone, this private person that I felt like I didn't even really know that well, um, was awesome because... He allowed her, he allowed every community member to express their love and support by coming and visiting the drive-in, um, buying the t-shirts, sharing their stories. The support to me was more epic than the storm itself, that, that our great community uh, really showed their love to us. Here in upstate New York, you know, we have the beloved Midway, um, and it's kind of an exception to the rule that when it got clobbered uh, by weather, the community rallied to bring it back. Whereas in most spaces, when it's been, these, a, a storm has taken down the screen, um, it doesn't come back. Mr. Selby called me up and he said, we'll be here, I forget what the date was now, but we'll be there Monday. And he says, if you want to book movies for Friday, go ahead. And I thought he was nuts, but he started on a Monday and I, I think he was packing his truck and going home on Wednesday. It, was, it just amazed me. And we've got a pretty nice screen up there. Now.
not just a screen you look at a movie on anymore. That was a lot of hard work. <laughs> a lot of hard work, and we all say it. It's, it's different when you come to the drive-in now for us, for sure. I remember when the cars started to line up, and I was just so excited. I had my camera, and the, there was a lady, and she had her two sons in the back seat, and I'm like, you guys are the first customers to come in, and the boys were just so happy, and they're like, we're so glad that you're open, and they were just all so, just so, everybody was so happy. To know they were coming in to watch a movie on the new screen, they were just like, wow, you know. There was just so much energy on the lot. The soft opening that the Midway Drive-In celebrated on Friday, August 29th, confirmed Jerry Selby's prediction that Nagelschmidt could start showing movies by Labor Day weekend. The most notable difference on the lot that evening, other than the brand new screen, was the yellow caution tape outlining an unpredictable and possibly unsafe play area. No one seemed to mind, and some instead took advantage of the enormous side lot to pass the time. Cindy and Maddie Reinhardt took up their usual post near the projection booth, where Little John, as he's affectionately known by so many, prepped the evening's first feature. By the time the crowd settled in and the movie started, the magic had already begun. The following weekend, the Nagelschmitts hosted the official grand reopening, three nights that generated even more excitement than the weekend before. Saturday night screening proved especially memorable. A technical glitch with the projector provided a literal showstopper and a story for the ages. After we had had that opening night and then the projector went down and it was almost a full lot and people had to go, but the people that stayed there on the lot after the, you know, everything was said and done, people stayed for like an hour and the kids just played and played and played because my dad left the lights on up on the screen and the kids just, people came and talked and just hung out and they were just so happy to be there, just to be a part of it. We offered rain checks and money back, but what was neat, it was, it highlighted how much the drive-in is you're there for a lot more than just to see a movie when you go to the drive-in. And people just started talking and gathering around, almost like a tailgate atmosphere. Um, everyone was so patient. And they all seemed to have a great time despite there not being a picture on that new screen. What had been an agonizing month for John Nagelschmidt had clearly turned a corner and may have set the stage for a prosperous future he hadn't even anticipated. Of course, I never knew what would happen the drive-in when I was done. I didn't think my kids were that interested, but uh, they made it pretty clear when we were contemplating if we we're gonna rebuild or not. But they, wanted, they wanted it here. They wanted it here for their kids. You know. If anything reinforced that, for both my sister and I, that we are dedicated the rest of our lives to keeping the Midway alive and well. So my brother and I went to him and said, we'll be here, we'll take it, we'll do it, we'll do whatever. And then so that's when I decided, I don't care if I have to give up every summer from now on. It's not giving up a summer, it's being a part of something bigger. Uh, John has a kind of a little Shangri-La, kind of a little oasis here. Um, one of very few in New York State. I, I drive a long ways to get here and it, it's worth the drive. Um, it takes me about an hour to get here. I'm about 50 miles away, but it, it's always a pleasant drive to come out and you know, spend a night at the drive-in and you know, enjoy it with the family. You guys like coming to the drive-in? Yeah! <laughs> What's your favorite part about the drive-in? Movie and the plane. Playing. Movie and the plane? <laughs> oh no, the food. And the food. And I like food. So you get to be here with all your friends, sleeping out, watching a fun movie. So you're, so you're gonna stuff your faces with food all night? I have only really to quote one of my children, my daughter Maya, um, when she first experienced, and she's uh, 20? She's 20 years old. Um, when she first experienced the drive-in, which I don't even know what. It, whenever she become, became self-aware enough to make a comment, she said, "It's like movies with camping. It's like an experience here." 
It's not just come see the movie, it's everything else. <laughs> That's what makes it nice. So you can see this movie at the, at the regular theaters, but it's better here? Oh yeah, yeah it's better it's here. Cheaper. cheaper and it's a lot bigger screen. And you get to show in your own car, so. Yep. Best. You guys are the best. You can see the, the outpouring of community support that uh, that they got when they when they asked for help. So um, I think you can see anytime you look around how much the community appreciates having uh, something like this to come to. We lost a summer, but we ended up with a new screen and an appreciation of how much the community really likes the place.